Hello, and welcome to MGE's annual Yom HaShoah program. I want to thank all of you for tuning in, and we're just going to wait just a moment for all of our um, Facebook Live fans, our YouTube fans, and everyone to sort of pile in and join this very, very important annual program commemoration for Yom HaShoah, for Holocaust Memorial Day which is being commemorated tonight and tomorrow throughout the world. <clears throat> thank you all for joining us tonight. And I thank you for those of you that are coming in here and taking time out of your schedule to join us at MGE to hear from a very special Holocaust survivor, Dr. Rustin, who will, I will be introducing in just a moment. And I wanna, again, just uh, thank you for joining. And uh, I wanna begin by thanking Rabbi Ezra Cohn MGE's COO and downtown director. I want to thank the entire MGE staff for uh, putting all of this together and doing all the hard work. And specifically to thank Zahava Schwartz, uh, our stellar educator, for bringing us uh, Dr. Rustin and uh, providing a lot of the information and substance for tonight's program. Tonight's program is sponsored uh, in memory of Harry and Terry Panuski. Harry and Terry Panuski of blessed memory are the grandparents of our dear friend, my good friend, Amanda Dreyer. She's a beloved part of the MG community. Many of you know Amanda. She's now a member of our MGE Fusion team. And I want to give special thanks to Alan and Alicia Pines, uh, our sponsors, uh, who have made this event possible. They've been sponsoring the last few years. MG is very special. Yom HaShoah, all in memory of Amanda's grandparents, Harry and Terry Panuski, both Holocaust survivors. May the Torah that we learn tonight, the inspiration that we gain, and the vital information about the Shoah serve as an elevation for their holy souls. As most of you know, MGE is an organization which is committed to engaging the 20s and 30s population in New York City and trying as best as we can to engage as many of our Jewish brothers and sisters in Jewish life. And so by definition, we don't really have anyone in our community who themselves have experienced the horrors of the Holocaust. Our generation has thankfully been spared the pain to which so many of our beloved grandparents or great grandparents have been subject. And since we did not experience this event firsthand, for ourselves. We have to learn it from others. And if we don't, then the simple passage of time, the historical memory will begin to fade. Now we could of course buy lots of books and we can visit museums, but nothing compares, nothing compares to hearing a story from someone who was there, from someone who somehow survived this extraordinary terrible moment in Jewish history. And I remember just two years ago, I was serving as a scholar in residence at a Passover program in Florida. And before the second night Seder, I decided that I would share some stories and some ideas so that the guests at the hotel could share some ideas at their Seder. And I began to read a story of a Jewish man's heroic attempt to observe Passover in a concentration camp, specifically in Bergen-Belsen. And as I was telling the story, this elderly gentleman stood up in the back of the room and he declared very proudly, he said, my name is Yaakov Gross and I was bar mitzvahed in Bergen-Belsen. And Mr. Gross, I turned to him. I asked, would you like to come up front and share your story? He said, no, 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 you're the rabbi. You came to teach this class. You're supposed to prepare us for the Seder. I don't want to interrupt you. And I, I said, Mr. Gross, I'm just reading this story from a book. You were there. You were there in person. Come up and tell us your story. And he walked to the front of the room. And in a heavy Hungarian accent, he shared that at the tender age of 12, he was deported with his family to Bergen-Belsen. And in the Nazis' attempt to show the Red Cross that they were treating the prisoners of Bergen-Belsen in some kind of humane fashion, he and a few other 12 and 13-year-old boys were told 
that they would be given a bar mitzvah in the camp. And the Nazi guard asked what that entailed. They had no idea. And Yaakov explained that a bar mitzvah gets an aliyah, gets called to the Torah. And the Nazis secured a Torah. They set up a table in the middle of the camp. They gathered together six 12 and 13 year old boys, including Yaakov, the gentleman who's telling the story in the hotel. And they stood there with a minion of older men ready for their bar mitzvah. One by one, the boys were called up to the Torah. And right there in the middle of Bergen Belsen, they had their bar mitzvah aliyot. And the news quickly spread throughout the camp that there was a safer Torah, that there was a Torah scroll, that there were Jews reading from a Torah scroll in Bergen Belsen. Hundreds of men began to emerge from the bunks, forming a line, all with the hope of receiving an aliyah. Mr. Gross, who's telling the story, continued to tell us that the line, he was 12 years old, looked like it was a mile long. Thousands of people, he said, stood there. And they stood for hours. They were hungry, exhausted, overworked. But they were waiting for a chance to recite a blessing over the Torah scroll. What a kiddush Hashem, said Mr. Gross. What a sanctification. What an honor to God to Torah and to our Jewish tradition, he said, which can never be taken from us. Just think about what so many of our grandparents and great grandparents went through, what they would do to say a bracha, a blessing over the Torah. My friends, we have joined this evening to commemorate the devastation that was the Holocaust, to memorialize the six million who lost their lives simply for being Jewish. But we have tuned in tonight to ensure that the rich Jewish life our grandparents lived in Europe also carries on. See, we're here tonight not just to remember how they tried to kill us and how we survived. We will hear that tonight from Dr. Rustin. But we're here for an even deeper purpose. We are here to demonstrate that their legacy and the Jewish values that our great grandparents lived for centuries in Europe continue to live on through us, we the next generation. We are here tonight not only to remember those who perished, we're here tonight to ensure that we carry on the values by which our grandparents lived, the rich Jewish traditions that they observed. And by joining us tonight and by tuning in, and coming online, whether it's on YouTube or you're on our Facebook channel, to hear Dr. Rustin tell his story, you ensure that the memory of the Holocaust is transmitted to yet another generation. And by being engaged in your Judaism, by doing something positively Jewish, we do something, in my opinion, even more important. And that is we give expression to the life of Torah and mitzvot that so many of our ancestors gave up their lives in the camps and that our grandparents and our great-grandparents lived and not just died for, but lived for centuries in Europe. Whether it's celebrating Shabbat, it's taking a class on Judaism, it's learning how to read Hebrew. We're going to Israel this summer. We're going to be outside this Friday night on the MGE roof celebrating Shabbat and Saturday morning services if you'd like to join us. We're coming back little by little. MGE is coming back. And we come back to Judaism because Judaism means so much to us. There is no better way to give honor to those whose lives were taken for being Jewish than by living Jewish lives ourselves. And we start tonight. That's what Judaism and what's what MGE is about, to get inspired and to engage ourselves in our Jewish traditions. And I hope and my prayer is that our program tonight, sponsored in memory, Harry and Terry Panuski. Thank you to the Pines once again. Thank you to the MGE staff. And most of all, thank you to the extraordinary gentleman that I now have the honor of introducing. Dr. Henry Rustin has been patiently waiting backstage. Welcome, Dr. Rustin. Thank you so much for being with us. Can you hear me okay? 
Thank you, Ron. Thank Perfect. You. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it is really such um, an honor and a pleasure to have you join with us uh, and to hear your story. I'm just going to give them a brief bio so they know a little background about your story, and then we're going to get into some discussion together with your permission. I asked uh, Dr. Rustin what I could call him, um, and because I'm used to referring to people older than myself by, uh, <laughs> he said, Henry, call me Henry. So I said, if you're Henry, then I'm Mark. I'm losing the rabbi title then, if you're going with Henry. Uh, so Henry was 12 years old. Uh, Henry was actually born in Ludge, which was a very large Jewish populated city in um, central Poland, very active and vibrant Jewish life. And he was 12 when the ghetto was opened in Ludge to which his family and all the Jews of Ludge were forced to live. And he was actually enrolled in school until 1941, and then he had to start working to receive food rations. And in August of 1944, the ghetto was liquid liquidated, and Henry and his family were sent to Auschwitz. And you'll hear the extraordinary story that he's going to tell. Um, Dr. Rustin was liberated on May 8th, 1945, at the age of 16. Is that correct? Henry, What's 16, it? you were? It was two months late, I was 16. Thank you. And after the war, actually, the family was reunited. And you hear about that. And they lived in Germany. And uh, he studied, actually, at the Technical University of Munich. And the family then came to the United States. And Henry received a scholarship to the University of Michigan, where he earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics and another bachelor's in electrical engineering. Not bad for someone whose uh, English was like, I don't know, probably the third or fourth language. And after he graduated, he served in the US Army, worked as an electrical engineer, and then got a master's in electrical engineering at Columbia University. He then returned to work, studied again at the University of Michigan, where he earned his PhD uh, in electrical engineering. And he's now Dr. Henry. Uh, went on to teach at the University of Pennsylvania and then at the Polytech Institute of Brooklyn, which is today NYU's School of Engineering, from which he retired about 20 years ago. Is that yeah. correct? A little more, yeah. A little more than 20 years ago um, as a professor of electrical engineering and computer science. He is co-author of a book on electrical engineering and an author of a book on programming, and he gives talks and has shared his story with many, many groups. Welcome, Dr. Rustin. Welcome, Henry. It is really an honor to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Mark. Um, let's start from the beginning. Tell us about your life uh, in Ludge, Poland, before the war. What was your family like? Where did you grow up? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> when the Germans entered Ludge, I was 10 years old. Uh, the school was supposed to start was early September, 1939, but because of war, schools did not start. <clears throat> German entered large almost immediately after war between uh, Poland, Germany commenced. Uh, there was no resistance. Uh, Warsaw gave a little more resistance. And almost immediately we had to wear yellow bands which were about a week or two weeks later, changed into stars on our outer clothing, yellow stars on the front and back of the clothing. Uh, soon, my father was an owner of a prosperous hardware store. About three or four weeks later, they threw him out of his store. And about the same time, they threw us out of our apartment. At that time, ghetto was being formed. Uh, the boundaries were not set yet. We moved into a one-room apartment, into one room, a part of a big apartment. A couple months later, we had to move again because this was not part of the ghetto. Uh, when we entered ghetto, the Jewish administration, under a man by the name of uh, Rumkowski, who was a controversial figure in the history of the ghetto, uh, and school reopened. Mm -hmm. I went to school. 
1941. And what, were, what was that like going to school? All the other Jewish kids also were continuing to go to school when you were in the ghetto? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I don't believe there were more than elementary school. Uh -huh. in six grades. Uh, I finished fifth grade. I finished fourth grade and fifth grade. And then school closed and everybody had to go to work mm -hmm. in order to receive rations, which were essential for bad survival. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to work in a carpentry factory, then another carpentry factory. And then <clears throat> in August of 1944, the water was liquidated and the body was shipped to Auschwitz. Now before, if you don't mind me just jumping in, tell us a little about before um, before you even were, were sent all in, into the ghetto, how did that change your Jewish lives? Were you able to live the same kind of Jewish lives you were living before? Maybe you could just give us a little glimpse into your Jewish life. Was there Shabbat? Was there synagogue? Uh, the, the was much curtailed. Uh, as far as I remember, there were no houses of worship. Mm -hmm. uh, anything what was done was done at home, privately. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it was an almost, there was, oh, I would say, almost impossible to maintain kosher. Mm -hmm. The I remember there was very little meat. I remember one time horse meat was given as a ration. Oh. And I rejoiced because there was no meat at all. A shortage of bread, hunger, which was going worse and worse. The ration was smaller and smaller. <clears throat> and Jewish life was very curtailed. Even though in some camps, uh, I don't know of any synagogue that mm -hmm. opened. Mm -hmm. No one was released from work on a holiday. We had to work on a holiday too. Mm -hmm. But what was was that? I mean, I, I assume that was the first time you you had to work on a Jewish holiday. Um, I mean, what what were what were the conditions of the ghetto? And and uh, well, I I was a kid. I was a small boy. I didn't work. Mm -hmm. First, I went to work and I in a factory. Which was producing gas for German a carpentry factory, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, life we had to work. I was working a six day week. My Sunday was the only time we were off. Mm -hmm. I had to work on Saturday. Uh, there wasn't much you can do, and so uh, it's come to religious life it was very much curtailed. I'm sure that some people were able to who prayed, but was much reduced. Right. Now, you have a question, I'm sorry, which I can't answer. No, 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 thank you. This is, this is, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, did you have any idea of what to expect when you were liquidated? You were in the ghetto for quite some time. Yeah, I uh, was in the ghetto from 1940, uh, about middle of 1940, till August of 44. Wow, four years in the ghetto. Yeah. Wow. And and did you have any idea when when did you know that they they did you I mean there were other groups that were taken before you to the camps. Well, did you? <coughs> we had really no information. Uh, there was a ghetto paper that was published. No information. We didn't know anything about the concentration camps. In fact, before while the ghetto was being liquidated. The German supervisor came before us and says, you're going to go as families, make sure to say, take pots and pans because you will need them in the new place. You're going to have more food. All this were, of course, lies. We were immediately separated once arrived in the concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the pots and pans, whatever we had, were left in the cattle car on which you came, we had no information whatsoever. There were no radios, there were no newspapers. I, I don't know if anybody had a radio. If anybody was found with it, I'm sure it was punishable at least with death, maybe double death, because uh, 
they hate people for much smaller offenses. Mm -hmm. And and when you were liquidated, when you and your you went with your family, you were taken together with your family. They announced uh, certain days, depending on what could work. Uh, <clears throat> my uncle and my aunt was a little boy who was four years old, who was born in the ghetto, and my grandmother were alive. So we were seven. My parents, I, my uncle, my aunt, the little son, and my grandmother. So we, you could volunteer, you could volunteer going earlier, but you couldn't go late. But all ended up going on to last Monday. Well, assembled. What happened is they kept curtailing the ghetto. <clears throat> Seven parts of the ghetto were of, of no entrance. Mm -hmm. The was getting shrunk. Few and few people were. Now, the ghetto population kept changing through the years because they kept importing Jews from Hamburg, from Berlin, from Vienna, from Prague, and other places, and kept sending people out to other concentration which you didn't know. We were mm -hmm. just in the mark. Uh, and what, initially, Rukoski was supposed to do a certain number of people. This didn't work out. So a German will come in with ghetto policemen mm -hmm. who work in the police, Jewish police in the ghetto, and they round up people. Catch us, catch can. Mostly they were looking people who do not look able-bodied mm -hmm. work for German. So population of ghetto kept changing because new people were coming in. Before the war, there were about 220, 225,000 Jews in Lodz. <clears throat> when the ghetto started, there might be 120 because many people uh, went to other places in Poland. Mm -hmm. When German entered Poland, they divided Poland into two parts. Right. Right. It was Reich, part of Germany, which is what all it was, and part of what they had collaborative government, which they called government. Warsaw was the government. Now the life was much better in the government part. It was no ghetto yet. The ghetto was also established maybe six months a year after the larger ghetto. And and it, and how old were you? You you were twelve, I think. You said when I, when the war started, I was ten. Oh, you were 10 when the war started. So how old were you when you were when yeah. you, you and your family were taken to Auschwitz that when the ghetto was liquidated? Uh, that was 1944. I was 15. 15. Okay. So you, you, you went with your family and you said that they were, they told you to bring pots and pans. So you, you took luggage with you. You took... You had right? enough stuff. You had enough stuff and, uh, some, and, a, and a, a suitcase, valise. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> when we arrived in Auschwitz, took about Auschwitz is maybe 200 kilometers from Lodz. Uh -huh. Overnight, we assembled maybe eight o'clock. We arrived in Auschwitz maybe seven in the morning. Next morning, uh, immediately uh, when they opened it, Germans assessed with dogs started rushing us out. Raus, raus, raus means go out, German. And immediately we formed a line, and women were separated from men. Now my mother went with her sister and the little boy. See, later I found out that they asked my aunt to give up her little boy of four. She wouldn't do it. She went with him, and she was killed. She was a guest and criminalized. So did my grandmother. My mother wanted to go with them. But they pushed her away. They could they realize what was going on, and she had, she survived. My grandmother, my aunt, and my little cousin did not survive. Now we were the three of us: my uncle, my father, and I. Did your mother? I'm sorry. Did your mother know at my the time mother, that did your did your mother know at the time that her sister and her little boy and no. her mother. She had, uh -huh. but her mother had the good sense of pushing him away. Wow. Uh, pushing her away. Uh, 
And I'm, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Then you were starting to say that you were with your father and, <laughs> and your uncle, okay. Uh, uncle by marriage. Uh, his wife was my mother's younger sister. Mm -hmm. younger mm -hmm. sister. Uh, and what was what was the scene? Yeah. I mean, they separated the men and the women, and and what where where did you went with your father and your uncle, and what happened then? Well, uh, first we went in line, and there was a short SS man who later I found was Doctor Mengele, who was just. His selection was another examination, just left, right, links. <laughs> and some people went to the left, some people went to the right. The people on the left never have never seen it again. They were to be guests and characterized. That he viewed as not being able bodied enough to work for the German industry. Uh, after that, we were assembled on a place where there was a big blanket. There were a couple of assessment and couple couples, couples. Couple mm -hmm. is an expression which you probably heard. Katset Polizei, Katset Police, Concentration Game Police, Jews or other uh, not German who are helping out the German. And the German says, to ask us to put all, all our valuable watches, pen, fountain pen, jewelry, whatever on that. If any will be found not giving it up, he'll be beaten to death. And 10 people next to him were also beaten to death just to prevent anybody from letting his men standing next to him hiding anything. So the blanket was filled with all the valuables that we had. Then we went into another line. And, <clears throat> uh, and we went to a room, which later I found had the name Canada, like Canada. We were asked to undress. And there were women sitting who went to our, our nude. And we went. <clears throat> Uh, well, it's our private parts were inspected just in case you hide some of the valuable there. And then we went to another corridor. And, uh, and uh, incidentally, just another Biden, uh, mm -hmm. there was a barber who knew who had a hump. There was, there was say, that, say that again, Henry. There was yeah. a what? Yeah, there was another detail. Uh, when I was standing in line mm -hmm. uh, in front of Mengele, uh, behind me was a man who knew who was a barber in the ghetto, mm -hmm. who had a hump. And Mengele passed him into the living part. Uh, when he went into the Canada, they saw as a hump and then put him into the bathroom, from which other people who seemed to have some imperfection were poor to be characterized. And Mengele did not see it, otherwise he would have been. But he is that some other people again were selected for destruction. <clears throat> after that, after we left the Canada in the note, we were disinfected mm -hmm. and <clears throat> eventually went to a shower. It took almost a whole day. And they were given Clothing. The clothing was civilian clothing with uh, red stripes, a, a red cross in the back, ill fitting pants. Uh, we kept our shoes. They gave us a little piece, rectangular piece of cotton, cotton that we used for socks. We uh, put our, we enclosed our feet into them and the lower socks. Uh, uh, but that time was maybe seven o'clock, seven, six, six, seven o'clock, and we're marching to Auschwitz. And this is this has taken basically an entire day from and the time the selection began with Mengele. You stay in line, walk slowly, it took an entire day. We arrived in Auschwitz maybe five thirty, six in the morning. It was about uh -huh. seven when we went, when we marched into Auschwitz. Wow, and, and you were at the whole time, 
Henry, you were with your father and your uncle. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, we we march into another part of Auschwitz. Uh, it's over three Auschwitzes. Auschwitz one, right. the main Auschwitz. Auschwitz two, Birkenau, which is one, went, which was, and there was not Auschwitz three, Monowitz. There was uh, a big, uh, uh, big industry. And people say I work in this German chemical plant industry, IG Carbon. And then there were another 40 camps, satellite of Auschwitz. Oh, wow. 40, you say? About 40 smaller wow. camps. And so, all, in, all in that same vicinity? In, in the area. In the area, OK. Now, uh, this was the German system. They had a main camp, like the one that was done later, was called Großwausen. I had 400 camps, satellite camps of 200, 400, 10,000. The IG of Harbin was big, was about maybe 20,000 people, 20,000 people. Uh, when we went in Auschwitz before the war, was a place where the Polish cavalry army, covered in the army, had the stables. Mm -hmm. The barracks were stables. And the way a stable works, the barrack is a long barrack. The width of a barrack, about two horses, the, the length of two horses, and has a low oven in between, so it can warm it up, heat it up, winter time. It has what in between? Say that again? An oven. An oven, okay. They can heat up winter, and the width is two horses. So it's an empty barrack with an oven in about two thirds, half or two thirds of it, low oven. <clears throat> uh, when we were assembled, uh, again, the couple said uh, to give us all valuables. Uh, anyone who will be found with valuables, same thing, will be beaten to death. We would not have any valuables anymore. But in any event, they had funds as people who were policemen in the ghetto. Some stood up, they were beaten badly, kicked and everything. And eventually after an hour or two, we were able to go to sleep. Now, where do we sleep? We slept on the floor. And there were wooden boards that were put on it. We must have been about 500. I don't think there was more capacity than maybe 200. Mm -hmm. I want to go to sleep. We slept on the boards, partially, partially on the board, partially on somebody else next to us. Was uh, what, what? What was the weather at the time when you when you were brought there? August, but it's, but it was August, late August. Uh -huh. Okay. It was warm, but it was raining. Mm -hmm. Now Auschwitz was a hellhole. Let me just describe to you a typical day. Got up in the morning, like maybe five thirty-six kicked out of this uh, barrack. Uh, you either stand, first there were no furniture outside. So if you want to sit down, you sat on the dirt, mm -hmm. wet dirt. Most of the time you stay in a formation. If you want to go to the bathroom, you could not. If you wanted to drink of water, you couldn't do it. You couldn't leave the formation, you were hit. The um, man in charge of the camp, who was a Jewish part, was a Pollock, a Paul, and <clears throat> who didn't have much warmth for the Jews. Uh, <laughs> anything uh, like was very cheap. Killing somebody, there was no, uh, there was no punishment for killing a Jew especially Jewish life was very cheap. And, and how did you, how did you adjust to this just mentally? It, uh, it's just too fast. Things got like slow, go to you, you go to the motion, you know, you don't adjust. It's one after the other, you know, it's, it's just you, you try to survive not to be bitten. You got one meal a day which was the soup, if you were lucky. 
some people were able to bring you in. It's possible we are at the end. You didn't get the soap. It was the food for the day. And you were able to be, you went, you went through all of this side by side with your father? I beg your pardon? You went through all of this, this, this first, these first few days in Auschwitz. No. You went through all of this with your father? You were in the same bunk with him? Bunk? There were no bunks. Was, barracks. Yeah, in the same barracks, right. The old two of us who kept together. Your uncle and your father, okay. Uh, there was only one way in Auschwitz. And this is, there were court examiners, Jewish examiners, who came, who were for carpenters, for electricians, for metal workers, who still never be lying. Just to try to get out and go to another camp, couldn't be worse. Uh, now, uh, after a couple of days, uh, my uncle, who had an electric store where he also was selling radios, uh, while we were caught for a job, my father and I uh, was able to be selected to another camp. Happened to be, it happened to be he survived. It was a Auschwitz camp, one of the satellite camps. Mm -hmm. uh, my father and I said, every line for carpent. Uh, about three weeks later, we were lucky. We were selected to go uh, as metro worker. I pretended to be locksmith. My father showed me how, how you operate, how you keep a file to make a key or something. Mm -hmm. Father was more familiar. Because oh, a, lo a locksmith. Had you ever done anything like that before? No, no but your father knew a little. My father too, showed me how to order file without a file. <laughs> and even it was selected. And next day, after about three weeks, we're on the way to another concentration camp. But this was his working camp, which was called Gross Rosen. That was the camp. Gross Rosen. Gross Rosen. The, the German title was Concentration Camp Gross Rosen, Arbeitslager, working camp, Friedland. Friedland was a small village, and we <coughs> eventually worked in propeller factory. So, and, and, and you were happy? I mean, this was a good thing. You were happy to get out of Auschwitz? It was still bad, but nothing like Auschwitz, especially uh -huh. that part of Auschwitz. Uh, imagine you stay in formation, you can't go to the bathroom, you can't have water, you're hungry, you maybe got the one meal if you were lucky. There's nowhere to sit down, even if you're in same formation. You can't stand, you sit down on a wet ground, you know, yeah. And then you go to sleep, you worry that you have shoes which you don't want to wear because you won't be able to sleep. You make a pillow out of your uh, outer garment and the shoes, and you're afraid somebody will steal it. What would you do then? You know, I, uh, 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 all I can tell you is said about the bar mitzvah and person person. They could not be. A bar mitzvah in Auschwitz. <laughs> it's, right. it's, it's much more primitive life. There could not be. There were no table. Was right. no table. So now, now you're you're in this other camp, and yeah. um, you had shared with me that you were working in a propeller factory. No, we're not there yet. Oh, uh, okay. We went. <clears throat> it took us three days to get to the place Friedland. Oh. We went to the camp and it was a brand new camp. The barracks were at brand new. And this was high living. We had bunks. Each bunk had a, a straw mattress. Of course, no pillow. But you had a place you can call your own. Um, my father and I had the same bunk. My father was down, I was up. And <clears throat> Uh, the following day, we went to a propeller factory. We went to a to a pre to learn how to do how to work on propellers. The factory we were going to work made propellers for yeah. for the Ger for the Germans for, for the planes for the German planes for the Germans. Uh huh. Uh, 
Now we went, and I was my father was given the job with General Fraser. Uh, the propellers are not finished; they have to be finished by hand. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. they have to be finished. They have to have a certain book. And they divided up to a section. The section propellers screw, a big screw, and you screw in the propeller. Mm -hmm. It has to be high precision because it's in the air, it must fit. It's very important. High precision, and it's a pretty big one. It's about a meter and a half, about five feet. What those big planes. And now, <clears throat> uh, my father. Uh, I was selected to be a checker, to check the propeller. My mm -hmm. father was selected to do the working of the propeller, of the raw propeller, mm -hmm. to finish it. The, uh, the propellers went to section, and he was working on the, uh, the section from 50 centimeter to, I think, a meter 50, whatever. Now, I... <clears throat> They pronounced me ready for the main propeller factory from the uh, from the place where they taught us how to work on the propeller. Mm -hmm. I went there after two weeks. My father stayed another week in that school or whatever, and came a week later. Because of that, they were on different shifts. Mm -hmm. Because my father started a week after me. So I saw my father only on Sunday, yeah. and, and <clears throat> uh, his bank was unoccupied when I was there. Uh, my bank was unoccupied when he was there, uh, and kept changing shifts mm -hmm. between. So I saw him every now and then passing, but I couldn't say anything because I'll get a butt, the rifle butt into my shoulder from one of the assessment. So I saw him on Sunday. Now. <clears throat> Uh, I was very lucky. Uh, the man, the German in charge of me, was a nice guy and took liking to me. Mm -hmm. Part of it was when I first came, he was working on what they called puzzle. He was working on what's called magic squares. You probably know what they are. Magic, what? Magic? Magic square. Magic square. square, okay. Say, for example, square three by three. Mm -hmm. Three little square in each row and color. And you put number from 1 to 15, 1 to 9, 3, 1 to 9, and each row and each column has to have the same sum. Now he was working on a 4 by 4, which is more difficult, one day. Now it's, it's a method to it. He did it by brute force. By trial and error, there's a method to it. I knew the method. I read mathematical books, and I showed him, and he was very impressed. Mm -hmm. So he took a so he took a liking to you. Seven seven, you know, because the methods the same. There are three categories of budget square, mm -hmm. and a different method for each of them. And I knew this, and he was impressed, and he was it happened to be a very nice old German, mm -hmm. and. It made my life much easier. It, was it difficult at all, just knowing that you're working for the German war machine, or you were just happy to get out of Auschwitz? And you had no choice. Right. You had no choice. And in fact, <clears throat> if you wanted to uh, somehow inhibit, uh, every time you did something, you signed a tag with your number, which you had. And you were responsible. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think we all wanted to survive so much. Sure. I don't think there was any way of just, just all wanted, I, at least I, survival. You, you survive despite the, everything you want to survive and hope for a better time. And, and how long did you and your father continue to work in this factory? Uh, we, we were in this factory till about six weeks before the end. Then the factory closed. 
the property didn't have no planes in it, which means we're talking uh, till the uh, till the beginning of April. April 1945. 45. Okay, so, so we're getting close now to the end of the war. In 1944. Right. Yeah. Now, after the close of factory, I, with another dozen people, work on a farm. I think factory closed, they probably didn't produce, didn't need propellers anymore. Mm -hmm. Didn't produce any more planes. <clears throat> Uh, it's an hour on the farm, same thing, long hours, hard work, no food, and so on. <clears throat> and then uh, the world was coming to an end. We had no information at all of what going outside, the fact that Germans were losing the war. You, you didn't know that the Germans were losing. As far as you're concerned, it's the no. same thing every day. Some information, what the Germans did, <laughs> Uh, they were moving people out of concentration camp mm -hmm. as Russians were approaching to other camps. And mm -hmm. in our camps, groups of people, uh, Jews, who came from other camp, who were marching from other camp. Uh, in fact, quite a number of people who survived died in the last months of the war once they had to march to other places. If they fell down, they were shot killed and when he couldn't do it and you you were not you and your father did not um were Our, not subjected mm -hmm. to that no and, and what what where, what did what did you think your where the where your mother was this whole time we didn't know you had no idea until, until after the war we didn't know we hoped that she was alive so when when then were you liberated and by who liberated by the russian Mm -hmm. German are very well organized. So when the SS left the camp, about three, two or three days before the end of the war, before May 8, 1945, mm -hmm. uh, they assembled militia in Friedland, in this village where the camp was, and gave them, uh, and gave them the keys, if you might say, that were to the concentration camp. Now the camp, and Wait, then, I'm, I'm sorry, just to clarify, the Nazis gave, like, literally the keys to the camp, or? They was a militia. Uh -huh. They formed a militia, town formed a militia, and the Nazis, uh, they come, uh, th there was some talk after war that the, command, that the commanding SS man, who happened to be a decent, I think, fairly decent man, an older man, who was in charge of the camp, was under order to kill everybody. And he didn't follow the orders. Wow. But part of what happened is that the city said if you wanted the, <clears throat> the prisoners who came to be killed because the Russians might have been taken out on some. I don't know whether it was the city that saved our life or whether it was the, the commanding assessment, who was an older man too. Uh, Many of the people who were the guards in the camp, at least the higher up, uh, were all the SS men who could not be used in the army, who could not be used for fighting mm -hmm. in the army. And then, in any event, uh, we had barbed wire around the camp and the wire was electrified. Mm -hmm. Uh, as this was in Auschwitz. In fact, mm -hmm. people were committing suicide by touching the wire in Auschwitz. Uh, as, as the Russian were approaching. Can I, can I ask you a question, Henry? And what, what gave you the fortitude to just continue to try to survive and not, God forbid, take your own life like, like others? Human, you try to survive. Uh, I don't know you. You, you just hope that things will improve, things will be better. Mm -hmm. And I think it is the human drive to survive that keeps you going. Mm -hmm. And you hope things will get better. Mm -hmm. no, thank you. Okay. My streets to freedom. Mm -hmm. I've definitely got better. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah.
and and, and um, food, probably you had a bank, you had people, you know, in the were about thirty in the room in the bar room, and it was a pretty good uh, comrade shop. Mm -hmm. uh, now there was no electricity, so the wire went up four to five. Someone got a pair of scissors and cut the wire and left the camp. And I went to the forest and could hear artillery, Russian artillery. Yeah. Uh, Wait, so, so just to keep this straight so everyone can follow. So the Germans have surrendered, but they electrified. Yeah. They didn't want to be caught by the Russian. Right. The last thing they wanted. So the Germans ran, they left, mm -hmm. but they electrified the fence, but the electricity wasn't working. Yeah. And then um, and someone was able to cut mm -hmm. the fence and then you escaped, basically. You left. Well, yeah. Right. Uh, there wasn't anybody. I, right. I think the German did not watch the camp anymore. And where'd you go? You just went into the forest? The forest. There was a forest nearby. I waited there. And then the Russian, I said, then the Russian, we saw Russian soldiers and we were assembled. And the commanding officers go, go, go to the German, take what you need, clothing, anything you want to, to the stores, take what you need. All of this is yours. <laughs> the, the, German, the German thought that we will become prisoners under the Russian. Well, so <clears throat> when I met my father, I was wearing civilian clothing. <laughs> you were, I'm sorry, when you met your father, you were wearing what? Civilian clothing. Civilian clothing, because you, you, you just went into a store and put some clothing no. on? Oh, uh, my, most of the apartment were abandoned. The stores were closed, locked, everything locked. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Most, uh, many Germans didn't want to be there either. And many of the apartments were empty. Whatever fit me, I put on. Now my father, uh, who is what my father uh, went into, uh, uh, whom I saw later, we separated. And then we said where we're going to meet. And my father, who had a store, and knew where he kept better merchandise. Uh, went into the shoe store and found he knew where on a side, generally under the display part, and found a very nice pair of shoes for me, brand new, <laughs> and another one for him. And he brought me. And then anyway, my father also found a room from a German lady. And we went there, and uh, we knew right away that we shouldn't eat too much food mm -hmm. because we got dysentery after our stomach shot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we didn't overeat for a couple of days. We just didn't overeat. We ate less than we wanted. Yeah, unfortunately, I hear there were terrible stories of people who, yeah. survivors who ate too much too quickly. Where, where was your mom? Tell us about your mother's liberation then. So I was uh, about with my father in Friedland, where the camp was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for about a week or 10 days. And then I decided to go leave my father in the apartment, the Zoom apartment for it. And <clears throat> I decided to go to Lodge to see who is alive or whether my mother's alive. Now, at that time, railroads were bumped, and the only railroads that went were military railroads. Uh, there were two other people who also wanted to go to Lodge, because a lot of, a lot of those people who were there were people who came on the transport with us when the Lodge ghetto was liquidated. So there were two other people, an older man, another man, and the Lord, it's an eye, and the three of us decided to go to Lodge. Mm -hmm. How how much of a distance you were saying when you went originally? The kilometers. How, how, kilometers. Uh -huh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's about 200 miles. Right. Uh, we took a streetcar. Uh, I <clears throat> laid out a map and you didn't know which way to go. You didn't know what was, uh, how much you can go by rail, how much you cannot. In any event, we went. Uh, uh, we took a streetcar to the last stop, and then we walk. 
and uh, we went. We once we went to Breslau, Breslau today, a fairly big city in <clears throat> in Germany then, Silesia today is Polish. Stayed overnight. We found another Polak who apparently was a painter, a uh, room painter. And <clears throat> we took some food with him. The food was already ample, plenty of food available. Mm -hmm. Took it with us. After that, we were able to get a corner railroad, which was a military railroad. Uh, immediately, the Russians started things out of Germany. And when the railroad was going to be 10 kilometers, stop, went back five kilometers. In any event, we were on this railroad for maybe three, four days. Oh, wow. Went 150 kilometers. Uh, I didn't choose a good road, so what's about to go? It took <laughs> 10 days to get to Lodge. Oh, my gosh. All right. I got to Lodge. I found my uncle. He survived. Wow. He survived. And he was liberated. He was not. He was in a sub camp of Auschwitz. He was liberated much earlier, maybe in March or April. And uh, uh, there was a market outside, and he was selling sheets. He was an electrician, selling sheets, mostly his sheet. Uh, had a table, was selling. And he told me my mother survived. Uh, she worked during the war in a paratroop in a. Uh, <clears throat> In a part of factory, and uh, she found out that we survived, and she left for Friedland a day before I arrived. Oh, oh my gosh! I stayed my a week. I, I, so wait, wait. So you you went all the way back to Ludge to find her, and she find, and so, find anybody else for my family. right for anyone else in the family. But she left the day before before I arrived. And she went basically to find you where you were previously. My father. Father. He heard from people from Cape Point. Right. Who already arrived from Lodge, uh, from Friedland, who are from Lodge, that you survive, and they were in Friedland. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so I was about a week with him, and then I found a better way of going to Lodge. Took only four days. And, and what was it like coming back home after the war? Well, it was later to see my mother, right. our family. We right. were a close family. I was elated, great thing. And so we lived in Friedland for maybe a month. And, and you were all reunited, and you were reunited with your family. We were reunited. Uh, just getting better. Now, my mother, uh, uh, after her camp was liquidated, just like our camp was liquidated. Uh, she was put on train and <clears throat> she and uh, another, uh, another, co another friend of hers who was on the train, who was also on the same concentration camp, escaped the train. And, and this was in Czechoslovakia, but the train went to Czechoslovakia and they walked for a couple of days and they essentially eat, uh, Yes, and then they found a Czechoslovakian farmer who brought her to who, and they stayed with him for a couple of days. And my mother, he nursed my mother back to health. Wow. One family, a Czechoslovakian family. And my mother arrived in Lodge uh, maybe a week before she left and found my uncle and stayed with him and was getting information of what happened. People started meeting people. In fact, what they did, the Jewish community mm -hmm. started keeping records of who survived and what is he almost immediately. And in fact, I went there and I found my uncle to there. Wow. Uh, so then we moved to a bigger city. Uh, which is called German name was Waldenburg, which was about 15 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Where Friedan was a village on the border of Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and there was a Polish community, and both my father and I went to work there. 
uh, I as a clerk and my father has a little higher position. And you're you're 16 now. Yeah, this is 45. I'm 16. Mm -hmm. 45, 16. And and were you were you at this time like you went back? You were going to stay in Poland. What was your thinking? Did you did you think what? about coming to America? To going to Israel? What what, what was going on in your family? I mean, uh, people are not that mobile in Poland. There are many people in Poland before the war who never went more than twenty kilometers from their home. Going to a big city uh, two hours by train was a big undertaking. Uh, at the time. Uh, didn't know yet, you know, what the options are. Did you feel a lot of anti-Semitism in, back in Poland after the war? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Give one, uh, before I say my own, let me give you one example. Uh, when the ghetto was liquidated, the German left about 300 people to clean the ghetto. And another maybe three, 400 hit themselves in the sewers. So when the Polish battalion of the Russian army, which liberated the ghetto, found there were about 700 Jews who survived out of 220,000. Apparently the first expression was against so many Jews. Uh, uh, now my own personal uh, uh First, <coughs> uh, after the war, I was working my lapel the Polish colors, which are white and red, like the Polish flag. As I walk, a soldier rips it up and says, you're not a Pole, you're a Jew. And there was an officer standing by laughing. Okay. Then when I walked, uh, when, when I was a clerk, uh, most of the, almost everybody was Polish in this, in this administration, a lot of antisemitism. Mm -hmm. And did you think you could try to make a life again for yourselves? Uh, look, uh, I was my family, you know, uh, right. I didn't make all the decision. No, of course. I mean, saying your parents, it would be. After a while, I decided I don't want it. Uh, well, I was the to Well, uh, my father's brother, my uncle, survive. He lived in Belgium before the war. Mm -hmm. During the war, he was on Iron Papers in France. And he was able to, go to get to the United States uh, very early, 1945. We found that he survived and he sent us papers, every day. To come, to go where now? Not to, for him. But, but T tell us how you eventually then came to America. Yeah, all right. Uh, he sent us papers to immigrate, immigration paper to the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, he was not a citizen yet, but family who already was a citizen. Mm -hmm. His brother-in-law was not a citizen yet, who came to the United States during the war, who lived in England. Uh, he had a partner, and a partner. He also had a, my father had a cousin, send us paper every David, which certified that it would not be a burden to the United States government. We decided to go to American zone of Germany and immigrate from there. Uh, we went, we went to Munich, but. Uh, we were in a Polish quarter because we were born in Poland. The Polish quarter was maybe two and a half thousand worldwide. Early, mm -hmm. early quarter. Just in Germany alone, in the American, must have been at least 100,000 people mm -hmm. papers to immigrate to the United States. Uh, Israel was not, was, was not established yet. So the question was, what other places can you go? Right. I was waiting. Canada was one. Israel was another. Australia was another. But then in 19, 1947, uh, <clears throat> Truman 
opened the gate with a DP quota, displaced person quota, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> were able to enter the United States in 49. So you came to America in 1949. And where did you where did you settle with your family in, in America? And before that, <clears throat> I lost a lot of education. I finished fifth grade. <laughs> War ended in 1945. I was 16. I should have been at 10th grade. I was right. behind. Maybe not because I picked up some things to, uh, in the ghetto. Sure. I on my own. I am trigonometry on my own and a couple other. But there were holes in my background. And I really wanted to catch up. So I did it in Germany. I got my diploma. The German have two types of diploma, Reifeprüfung, Zertifikat and Abitur. Mm -hmm. For university study, you need the Abitur. I got the Abitur. And I went to the Tech University of Munich for one year. Then, our papers, then my papers came through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I left Germany and came to the United States in May of 49. And then you uh, enrolled in um, University of Michigan. And not, you got not yet. I didn't speak English. And we needed money to live. Right. So it, a few years later, then you had to. Uh... I first got a job <laughs> uh, in a doll factory. <laughs> in the minimum wage of 65 cents an hour. 65 cents an hour. Minimum wage. $26 a week. Unbelievable. Well, <clears throat> the owner, uh, the owner, the two owners were. Jews with Hungarian background. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the owners says, you're going to get more money, but slowly. And in six weeks, I'll give you a nickel more. You're going to make 70 cents an hour. After that, every four weeks, I'll give you a dime more till you get a dollar, which was a lot of money then. Mm -hmm. A sure. dollar an hour. Uh, and after that, we'll see. Well, Seven weeks, because I don't have a race. Uh, six weeks. Uh, I asked him, there's a mistake. I'll give you a race. But times are bad. I won't be able to give you a race after that for a while. So next day, I went to Hylas. Oh. Another job. In a... Hayas, a Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. I beg your pardon? Yeah. You, you went to Hayas. And they got you another job. Hayas, yeah. Uh -huh. And they were very helpful. And so he sent me to a girls' call factory, and they offered me better working on it. Incidentally, while I was making 65 an hour, I probably work as hard or harder than I did in concentration. Oh my God. <laughs> the less money you make, the harder you work. The harder you work. Well, you, be you believe, uh, Henry, it's up to 15 an hour now. <laughs> 15 dollars an hour. It's a couple of years. 90 cents an hour, or whatever, 80. Right. And the company was better. The people were nicer. My email yeah. supervisor, the owner, uh, was just about that. They really were nice people. Uh, meantime, I was learning English. I tried to catch up my English as much as possible. Well, that was, how was I doing it? I, there were courses for New American. Uh -huh. I took two of them, which was two days a week. For this. I was going, to, I started going to a high school and taking mathematics, mm -hmm. not because I needed it, but to learn English. So I forgot uh -huh. to study something that I know. Uh, in fact, I had an experience there. Uh, I was taking a course in trigonometry, which mm -hmm. I knew. And uh, the t teacher asked about the solution as my hand. And I had a small slide though in my pocket. And I went into the problem, so I don't know, no slide. All right, take a table. <laughs> and I have a formula which is better for the tables that you use, which is table of logarithms. And so now we didn't teach that. <laughs> I could use any formula, but happened to be you use logarithms, you can multiply. So you want a formula where you do multiplication, not addition, because you can add a, a log logarithms. A, a, he didn't know the formula. So, but in any event, 
Well, um, just 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 to fast forward you for a minute, this is fascinating. You you after you graduated from college, okay. So yeah. w with two with two bachelor's degrees, yeah. okay, one in mathematics and the other one electrical engineering, you then served in the U.S. Army. Were you drafted in the army? You enlisted in the army. Uh, the story was, I couldn't get any more deferments. I was getting deferments while I went to school. Sure. So I was not a citizen. Because I was a permanent resident on immigration, I was subject to draft. Uh, <clears throat> I, was, I started going to my master, in fact, at the Polytechnic in Stowe, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And I appeared before, before a local board, selective service board, and says, give me another year, I'll get a master, I'll be close to my citizenship, I'll go to OCS, Officer Candidate School, I'll be more valuable. There were five people at the table, but in the head, I'm sure I have. Mm -hmm. yeah. They vote five to zero to drop me. So I went, I want to speed up the draft to get it over with. So I want to so circle my volunteer. And I was two years out of regular army. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then when you came out of the army, so that was um, you. Well, I was yeah. about three months earlier to go to school. Uh huh. And when did you, um, when did you get married? <laughs> I'm curious. I got married much later. Much later. It was 1959. I was looking at. I was married 59. 1959. Okay. Five years later. I got uh huh. Um, your wife of uh, blessed memory, your name was Janet. Janet. Uh, how did, can I ask you how you met? I beg your pardon? Can I ask you how you met? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I lived in Michigan at that time. I was working okay. in Michigan and going and trying to get a PhD. <clears throat> and uh, during the summer, on vacation, one summer, I went to a, uh, to a <clears throat> place, to a resort, which is called Green Mansion, okay. which is mostly Jewish singles. Uh -huh. I mostly took tennis club. I was playing tennis. <laughs> what, what, what was it called? Green Mansion. Green Mansion, okay. It was it like a Grossinger's, the Concord, that kind of Concord. kind of place? But, yeah. I, but this was open uh, only during the summer, I think. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it's uh, just like Tamament. Did you heard of Tamament? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, but like Tamerman, except yeah. tend to attract uh, tennis card. And most people came on a weekly basis because the uh, weekly fair, weekly fee was more, more like maybe five days uh -huh. paid to go for a week. And I went with a colleague with whom I work when I work in industry before I went back to Michigan. And uh, as we were checking out of our room, uh, my future wife, whom I did not send, pulled up and asked us to move my car. I was driving, pulled our car so that she could unload. Well, I took out her coffee. <laughs> so we went the same week. We did not meet this week. I took her for coffee. And being first work, I took her telephone number <laughs> and her address. In those days, you didn't use telephones as much. It was the road. It happened to be that I uh, was uh, I was coming from Michigan every now and then to visit my parents who lived in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went out a couple of days. We clicked. Uh, then we met again. Then she went to Michigan. And six months later, we got engaged. Wow. Beautiful. And you together had three daughters? Three daughters. Uh huh. And how many grandchildren? Six. Uh, you have five six. Boy. What, five girls and a boy, you said? Yeah. All right. Can I just mention I wrote them down? I wrote the names Farron, Mario, Hunter, I guess that's the boy, Olivia, Juliet, and Charlotte. Okay. I'm sure you've had a lot of nachas, yeah. a lot of, uh, a lot of joy from them. I'm very lucky. It's yeah. my family. Uh, lucky throughout life. I consider myself very lucky. Do you, um, I, I can't even imagine 
none of us can imagine, Henry, what it must have been like to survive the Holocaust, come to America, get two bachelor's degrees, a master's degrees, a doctorate, become a professor at NYU, become a professor at Penn, marry, have children, and just, you know, pass on your Judaism to yet another generation, two generations. I mean, what, what is that like? I mean, do you? I feel myself very lucky. You know, like uh, going to the war, well, well like <clears throat> uh, throwing dice and hitting a six every time. I mean, one of the impossible things, you know, impossible things just happened against the odds. Uh, you make uh, a decision that looks bad today and proved to be very good tomorrow. You make a decision that you think is very good and proves to be catastrophic tomorrow. Uh, just one instant. Uh, we were supposed to go to Warsaw. Mm -hmm. My aunt went to Warsaw. Uh, the only way to go was by, by a horse-driven wagon. All right. Uh, we went there. We went there, and there was not enough room for for our belonging, so it didn't go. It looks like this is when was this, Henry? When when what are we talking about now? We're this was in thirty nine. Okay, we're going back before before. Okay. Uh, most of my father's family, his brothers, his sisters, uh, went to Warsaw. Okay. The Warsaw was government. The Lodge was Reich. It was more food. There was no ghetto. There was no ghetto there yet, but we were talking earlier. The early ghetto was planned in Lodge. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> uh, but at that time, it was a big mistake. We didn't get to go to Lodge. Well, uh, we didn't get to get to Warsaw. But to the Zorzan, no one in Warsaw survived. Because the form the, the site had putting people into beds and beds and beds and not the bad camps. Camps where people were killed almost daily. A lodge, uh, Rumkowski, because he produced, because he produced goods for the German. Right. Camp lodge late. And survival was inversely proportional to the time you spent in a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the lucky things was that I wasn't that long in concentration. Right, you you were you were liquidated. The Lodge ghetto was liquidated forty four and I, mean, I was nine months. Right, and, uh, and and had you, I mean, I guess the point you I don't want to. You, you were trying to get to Warsaw, but you're saying had you gotten to Warsaw, things would have been much worse. No, right. At that time, it looks like a big mistake. Right, because people I, were giving us packages, food packages, family. For more so. And if you, I guess if you know now, if you knew then what you know now. Yeah, but it looked like a bad move. Right. It could be life saving. And this couldn't throw out what appeared to be a good move today, proved to be catastrophic tomorrow, vice versa. And you never knew. Never had the foresight. Well, you know, they say that, you know, man plans and God laughs, you know, sounds better in Yiddish, but sometimes I guess we, you know, from where things are from our perspective, you know, we think one thing, but the reality is yeah, way, right. very, very different. You know, um, t well, tell me, t tell me, Henry, because we, we, we're going to have to bring this to a close, uh, although I could sit and talk to you forever, and this has just been so illuminating, and I you've just been such a wonderful a guest of ours. Um, I don't know who else to. Um, why do you tell your story? And well, when, I feel it can happen again. Uh, when Hitler first was coming to power, even before, Jewish financier supported him, some of them. And I think up to the Kristallnacht, everybody felt uh, the Jewish population of Germany. Uh, felt that Germany is probably the last place where men like Hitler will occur, more likely in the Slavic and the other countries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jews, Jews were most assimilated in Germany. Uh, 
but it wasn't. As I mentioned before, I believe, I mentioned when I spoke before, I mentioned Philippe Rothbaugh. He's <clears throat> going to America, and I believe such a scenario is possible. The plot against America. You read the book? I have not, no. By Philip Roth. Yeah, it's a well-known book. I haven't read it. Right. And uh, it's an alternate history of the United States. Mm -hmm. A loose election. Lindbergh is elected. Uh, makes a pact with Japan and Germany. The Jews are put, uh, not concentration camp, but like Japanese into camp. And uh, I think things like this are possible. We must be very uh, must worry very much and not allow it at a time when we have some say that it's too late. And I think yeah. this to be told just to prevent it, its occurrence for a second time. History repeats itself. Wow. So what's your message to us based on that, Henry? I mean we feel so secure in America. And I, you know, as I'm listening to this, I think about my own grandparents. They were from Germany and um, they felt so comfortable there. They were there for centuries. Yeah. And, um, and they thankfully got out. They came in 1939, they were able to get out of Germany, but a lot of their friends perished because they felt like, why would, you know, like you said before, the Slavic countries, that would make more sense for something like this to happen. But you know, um, in, in, in a, such an enlightened, you know, Germany was the, you know, you're a scientist. Germany was the, was the center of technology and science. It was the, um, you know, people used to go to the University of Berlin. It was like the Harvard of Europe. And for this to happen and unfold in Germany, I mean, the, are you trying to say that that, you know, that, that, that should give us pause, that, that this could happen anywhere in, in the most enlightened country? I mean, uh, Hitler was democratically elected. Yeah, I think it can happen. And I think we should worry and look at the sign when it's time to do something before it's too late. Mm -hmm. and, and do you think the answer is Israel? Well, do you think the answer? Uh, I don't think Israel can put everybody in. <laughs> I think Israel needs Jews in America to help it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear you. What uh, what Jewish message would you like to leave us with? You've got a lot of viewers here listening. MJE, the organization that I'm privileged to uh, to lead, um, is primarily 20s and 30s um, young Jewish people living in New York City, um, going about their professional lives. Uh, we are trying to inspire more Jewish commitment, more Jewish study and learning about our heritage, being more connected to Israel and being more connected to each other, what would you tell our, just given your extraordinary life story? Just <clears throat> uh, remember the number of connections that we have. First comes the family, then comes our community, then comes the country. And it is very important to maintain links to the community. And it's very important to be vigilant Early, when you see one son, just don't dismiss it. Don't say, he doesn't mind it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't mean that. He only says it. No, he might mind it. Be vigilant. And don't let another Hitler happen. Wow. Okay, so be connected to the community. I can't think of a, of a better plug for, for what we do. <laughs> Thank you. Be connected to and be vigilant. And when, call it out, you're saying, when when someone... Um, is spewing um, anti-Semitism, someone Stop is spewing it. this kind of hatred. Ignore it. Don't ignore it. Wow. Henry, thank you so much for... Put it in the bot just before it goes. Yeah. Uh, don't, don't just dismiss it. He doesn't mind it. He just talks about it. No, he minds it. And and I and I appreciate the the call for community because uh, it, it's an incredibly important thing. Um, and there are just too many young Jewish people that are not as connected yeah. to each other. You know, you talk about your community in Ludge, 
and the way it was in Poland. It was such an active, vibrant Jewish life. Yeah. Um, yeah. The family comes community. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I, I, I thank you so much for your time. And, um, it's a pleasure. Uh, it was such an honor and a pleasure. And I, I, um, I, you. it was very nice to meet you too. <laughs> um, yeah. You have maybe many more more interesting lectures. I hope you do. <laughs> you know, I think you're the founder of this group, are you not? Yeah, I started this uh, 22 years ago. Um, and uh, I have to tell you that meeting someone like yourself is one of the greatest privileges of my rabbinate. Yeah. To, to be able to meet someone of such great faith, you know, you you um, you use the term against all odds. That you your life is against all odds. You used you used an expression about you know throwing the dice, getting a six on yeah. every every turn. You know. your, my cousin. She even beat big it out. Uh, she was born in 1939, in April of 1939. Uh, she had no chance of survival. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think I, I thought around. Uh, I was sorry. I had, she may be in the audience. I, sh I think she's an audience. Uh, she, uh, her aunt. I my story. Do I know it? Her aunt was on a paper where her mother was in the crack of ghetto mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and mother knew that she could not possibly have survived and she gave her to her sister around and the sister was the way i know it the sister was recognized and felt she has to go to the ghetto because otherwise she will be identified as a jew outside mm -hmm. the ghetto. and brought her uh, i might have again i might have nothing to story but she brought her to the orphanage and they took her in and while she was in the orphanage she was uh, so again she was born in april in september she was five months old she was brought up and the nuns were teaching kept repeating jews are the christ killers jews are the christ killers they remember jews are no good the christ killers and in fact, uh, she didn't want to go when the war ended. And she, uh, her father knew, her mother did not survive. Her father knew uh, where she was and when she was picked up, she was very unhappy. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to go to the Christ killer. And uh, she lives in the United States. And, uh, wow. her, uh, her, against, I mean, against, against all odds. Is she listening? What's her name? Ilona Halper. H-E-L-P-E-R. Halper. Ilana. Ilana, if you're listening, <laughs> thank you for, for, for joining us tonight. And, and God bless you too for, again, again, against all odds. I mean, just incredible. Happens. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Rustin, thank you so, so much for your time and for giving us, being so gracious with your time and giving us so much detail. You know, we, we, we didn't, we didn't have the honor of, uh, not everyone has the honor of meeting a survivor who has such vivid recollections of all of the details. So we thank you and you should have continued nachas and joy from all of your children, your three daughters and your, your six grandchildren. Um, Hashem should bless you at least until 120, at least until 120. Um, God should bless you with just continued good health and sharpness. And um, it's an unbelievable thing. Also, we didn't even make a big deal about how you can go from being a survivor to a professor in Ivy League universities in this country um, after learning the language and just coming from a completely different culture. Um, you're a true, true inspiration, and uh, thank, you. Um, thank you so much for being with us. It's really, really an honor. And good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will, uh, we will be in touch. Please, God, I have will. a wonderful night, and thank you for uh, thank for you for honoring us with your presence and your extraordinary story of survival. Thank you.